So we were talking about the idea that uh, some companies that um, you know, in some industries, in some situations, if the complementary resources like the infrastructure needed to create widespread demand and or let's say to service that demand uh, is is expensive but it's necessary then the followers can actually avoid making those investments um, and wait until the the industry has developed like we were giving the example of frozen foods you know now we take it for granted that there are these freezers and frozen you know foods everywhere but you know back before that was uh, available the um the pioneer for the frozen food industry uh, a company a brand called bird's eye it was from unilever had to make all those investments in freezers in supermarkets because previously there was no such thing as freezers in the supermarkets it was all just um, refrigerated, you know, or cold, you know, ice boxes and cold chain. Similarly, in um, back in 2005, the ice cream uh, in Turkey, I remember reading this research. Uh, we were, you know, thinking about what new product categories to enter when I was at Sutash as a consultant. And the industry research that I read on the dairy industry, it said that the fastest growing food category in dairy was ice cream. It was growing at 42% year on growth. It wasn't, though, the manufacturing that was so difficult. It was just the, the distribution that required huge resources. Um, you know, imagine that the, you know, froze the freezers to distribute frozen ice cream and the trucks to, you know, deliver frozen ice cream is very expensive so to invest in all that uh, infrastructure was difficult at the time you know nowadays there you know Ulcare and you know other other companies like Unilever they put lots of these freezers you know for ice cream freezers around you see them um, but at the time you know there were there there were very few I shouldn't say none but it was it was underdeveloped so companies that are large, they can actually wait and, uh, you know, engage in what's called like active waiting, you know, active waiting, just wait for uh, the resources or these, um, you know, infrastructure to be developed. Whereas smaller companies, you know, they often cannot afford to wait, you know, bigger companies don't want to make um, mistakes, you know, these bigger companies they want to wait and see if it's going to take off, you know, if the um, if it's going to move past the niche market and transition to a, a large mass market. So, but it's not that they're just waiting, you know, in vain or waiting in a, in a lazy way. They're, they're doing what they call active waiting, you know, taking time to um, assemble the right resources in the right way and wait for the market to develop. Smaller companies, you know, typically have to um, take the chances. They can't afford to wait. You know, they can't afford to wait without these complementary resources. Um, so they're kind of forced to move fast. So then the last question is, you know, is there potential to establish an industry standard? Um, what's an industry standard? Um, you can think of industry standards as the um, the dominant paradigm or the dominant design. Uh, it can be a technological standard, it can be a design standard. Like, well, first of all, you know, if there is potential to establish an industry standard, then there's advantages in leadership. Okay, there should be, you know, if you can make this one. Uh, standard this this one technological or design you know the common um, way of doing things then there's advantages in leadership because you can make that standard world you know uh, it, you know used by everybody um, let me let me give you an example but let's look at what standards are first so a 
emergence of a dominant design paradigm. So for example, on keyboards, right, imagine, you know, you without even looking down, you know that the keyboard the top row is Q W E R T Y, and this is the standard on all laptops or you know keyboards on your computer, on your phone, right? Interestingly, though, the reason that it became this standard wasn't because it's the most efficient. Actually, there's a better, you know, it's called the Dvorak Simplified Keyboard. This actually allows people to type much faster. The QWERTY keyboard was actually designed to make people slow down their typing because back when it was you know a typewriter and not a computer typewriters you know they had those keys that would like click 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 you know and the keys would get stuck together if people typed too fast so the arrangement of the letters on the QWERTY keyboard was made in such a way as it actually would slow down the speed with which people could type words and that would prevent the keys from getting stuck together uh, so the Model T in autos, you know, the, the Ford Model T became the dominant design. You can see, you know, on cars today still, four wheels, typical, two headlights in front, the steering wheel, you know, the windows, the, the turn signals, you know, well, you don't see the turn signals there, but you know what I'm saying, that the, this became the dominant uh, approach. And then in aircraft, you know, the Douglas DC-3, became the dominant design in aircraft and that's pretty much what we still see today is a typical approach um, microsoft windows became the dominant uh, operating system in software and pdfs the Do adobe's pdf the dominant um, in, in documents another technical standard or design standard is the usb right we have usb we have micro usb and all the companies that use this as a standard right it doesn't you know it's not like one company makes usb it's like everybody is using this standard there's also technical standards um these emerge in industries where there are network externalities so now you have to ask the question what's network externalities um, network externalities exist when um, these uh, ecosystems form around particular concepts or standards. Like, for example, um, it's based on user linkages. So they become um, standard because you know the the standard is a standard is adopted because of the amount of users that uh, come into the system. So for example, telephones, right? The value of a, a, teles a telephone, it only exists if there are other users, right? Or online uh, gaming platforms only are, um, the value is, is, is more the more users there are. So this is a, what we call a network externality. It means like the the value of that standard is is more valuable. The value of that product is more valuable. It gains in value the more users there are. So you think like telephone, right? If there if you only had one person on this telephone, it, it's useless, right? So the value of the telephone, the value comes from its ability to connect to others video game consoles, right? The same platform allows users to exchange games and to play interactively. Even, uh, you can think of uh, like eBay, right? Or online auctions like eBay. The value of the auction depends on the number of buyers and sellers participating. If nobody's participating, then the, there's no, you know, the eBay, the auction, the online auction has no value. You can even think of it in terms of social identification. You know, listening to the same music, watching like the same TV shows like Game of Thrones or whatever, you know, everybody comes in and they start talking like, hey, did you see the episode last night? You know, wearing the same clothes, you know, the same football team uniforms. Um, you know, the more people participate, it becomes like a, a bandwagon effect, right? Everybody's doing the same thing. There's this social value. There's value to this. Um, you can kind of enjoy each other's uh, participation. So these are 
network externalities, they're what we can also call network effects, network effects that arise through the user linkages. But also we have network externalities that arise through the availability of complementary products, or what we call network effects, through complementary products. So for example, you know, PC applications, not not Macintosh, you know, not Apple, but PC again became the dominant um, operating system because there were so many complementary software applications written for it. It helped helped create this network effects, helped make Windows more useful, added value to the Windows platform because it was so widespread and it helped keep it widespread, helped cement its position as the dominant platform. You know, imagine that if no, um, you know, no, uh, nobody was writing software for Windows, right? It would be useless. In, uh, in cars, it's much easier to get parts and repair for, you know, Ford Focus or Honda Accord than for a Ferrari or for a Lamborghini. And actually, this is why I drive my, you know, um, Mazda Demio, strictly for this reason. That's why I chose not to have a Ferrari here. Um, you know, but this is the part of the appeal of, of, of having these common cars. Actually, it's quite a, an important thing to have this, you know, widespread availability of parts. It also helps economize on switching costs. If, you know, if there are, you know, um, I'm not, no, no, I'm sorry. It, it, it helps create network effects if you can economize on, on switching costs. That is, imagine that, you know, SAP software or some other software like Microsoft Office, everybody's using this software, then it kind of embeds the standard and it kind of says well keep using it because there's switching costs if you want to learn how to use a new software it takes time energy so it just allows microsoft office to stay in a dominant position or sap software if a company is using sap or this university is using sap enterprise management software it makes it more difficult to you know switch over because you know there's these switching costs so you know people will say, well, let's, let's stick with it, and then it can spread. You know, it spreads, becomes more dominant. So this is, you know, the network effects or network externalities. And again, if there is the, um, and these help create standards. So if there's a, a, an ability to establish an industry standards, if there are these sources of network effects or network externalities, if this is possible, then you can help try to establish an industry standard. Then there's, you know, the um, the benefit of uh, being first and innovating, you know, being the innovator. So uh, emergence of standards, right? The emergence of a dominant design paradigm like the QWERTY keyboard, or emergence of technical standards, um, which exist in industries where there are network externalities like telephones or USB or, you know. Um, not USB, but, uh, you know, game platforms or software. Um, and the entrenchment of these dominant designs and technical standards, it, it, it is, again, gained through these learning effects, you know, um, being embedded in this ecosystem and improving, constantly improving the dominant design so that it doesn't fall behind, it doesn't allow competitors to catch up. And again, with the switching costs, so getting them embedded into the the ecosystem, you know, entrenching, entrenching, you know, making them more stronger. We also, you know, to change them, to change them is, you know, needs coordination. It needs coordinated action by uh, multiple players, right? So um, to uh, entrench these standards, then, you know, for example, with Blu-ray, that, that became, Blu-ray became a standard in the standards war because many, many um, partners agreed that that would be the one that they would use. And it, it all, you know, is the, um, the uh, movie studios, 
the electronics manufacturers, you know, all of them had to agree, like, this is what we're going to use. We're going to use Blu-ray as the high-definition standard.